FMC, thank you for this opportunity to speak at the first Friday webinars uh, series, which I think is an excellent program. I had a chance to check out some of the previous uh, webinars. Really excellent. This is my first time here, so I'm really excited. And my topic today is ticks. And I saw a comment in the chat box, does this subject tick you off? <laughs> that was good. So yeah, uh, I will cover a little bit about the biology and behavior, which is quite fascinating. And then talk a little bit about management in community environments. Initially, I intended to focus just on lawns, but in the case of ticks, they are not just restricted to lawns, right? So I thought it might be good to include a little more area than lawns. So that's why I said community environments, okay? And what are these animals? What are ticks? Well, the first thing to recognize is that they are not insects. A lot of people think they are insects. They are related, of course. They belong to the same phylum, arthropoda, and, and a different class, arachnida, which includes spiders, scorpions, and all of those fascinating creatures. And ticks belong to the order Ixodida. That's a little bit about the taxonomy. And um, so ticks are small arachnids with eight legs. That's similar to spiders, right? Uh, whereas insects have six. I hope everyone remembers that. Uh, so ticks are external parasites. And they feed on blood of uh, different animals, mammals, birds, sometimes others like reptiles, amphibians. And all ticks are parasitic. So there's no tick that does not feed on blood. They all feed on blood. They cannot use any other food source. Right? So that's about their food habits. And ticks are incredibly diverse. And this is uh, uh, something that always interests me because I study insects, which are the most diverse creatures on the planet. So ticks are not as diverse as insects, but they are pretty, uh, pretty diverse. And, and remarkable, I would say. And there are close to 900 species described in the world and about 85 here in the US. And there are only three families of ticks, which you know makes it easier to study them. And uh, the first is the Ixodidae or the hard ticks, which are distinguished by a hard plate or scutellum on their back. You can see it in that uh, middle picture there. And their mouth parts, and, if you, uh, and we'll see more pictures, I promise you, <laughs> lots more pictures. You can see the mouth parts projecting forward from above when you look at the tick from above. Whereas soft ticks or the family Argacidae, they don't have that hard plate. They're just soft and round, you know, oval all over. And neither can the mouth parts be seen from above. So it's a quick thumb rule to distinguish between soft and hard ticks. And then there's one more family which has only one species described so far, and um, it's called a monotypic taxon. Uh, so anyway, we don't have any Natalia Elidid uh, members here in the US. They're only found in Southern Africa. So that's about a very quick overview about the tick, tick taxonomy. And uh, next is a quiz question. Find the tick, okay? So how many of you can, uh, can recognize a tick and how many ticks are there in this slide? So just think about the answers. I'm not going to, you know, this is not going to be graded or anything. So uh, just think, keep it in your mind. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. Aha. Mm -hmm. Did everyone get that right? <laughs> Did everyone, I hope everyone got that right. If not, no worries. We'll be talking a lot more about these animals in this presentation. Okay. So that's the tick on the right bottom right uh, corner. And here's another picture, a larger, more uh, zoomed in picture of a tick. That's a brown dog tick, which we'll be talking about more certainly. Okay. And um, here is a general life cycle of a tick. So it goes through four distinct life stages. Uh, like many other arthropods do that. And um, so the first is the egg, of course. And um, so ticks don't give live births, they, they lay eggs. And the eggs hatch into a, a stage called the larva, which, is, uh, which means a young one, which is different from the adult in, in some ways. So, you, you know, insects have larvae too, right? And if you think of um, a caterpillar, 
right? A caterpillar and a butterfly, they're distinctly different in appearance, in, in what they feed on, all of that. Uh, so a larva is very different from the adult in, in many ways. And that's why in this case, larva, the larva has only six legs. So that's the difference. And of course, it cannot reproduce. It looks, it looks slightly different, all of that. And then the larva changes into a nymph, which has eight legs. So nymphs are young ones, which are very similar to the adult. So think of a, a grasshopper young one, right? It looks similar to the adult. So there you go. So that's a nymph. And in this case, it looks more similar to the adult tick than the larva. And then the nymphs turn into the adults. And ticks need blood meals at every stage to survive and to move on to the next stage. So blood is essential for them. And blood feeding strategies, okay? So um, heart ticks, so they, they're slightly different depending on the family. So heart ticks stay attached to their host for varying periods of time, sometimes multiple days. So if you don't notice it, it'll stay there until little, you know, it decides to fall off. So sometimes they stay on attached for a long time and their life cycle is variable again in duration, depending on the species. And it may include one or many hosts. So there are one, two and three host ticks. And these characters are very important in pathogen transmission. So ticks are very important vectors, right? So this is important. And how about soft ticks? Soft ticks, on the other hand, attach for longer periods as larvae. And then uh, they use a feed and hide strategy. They feed and they hide on the host and, and feed. The feeding times are shorter. They don't stay attached for days together. Sometimes it's just 30 minutes. Sometimes it can be even less, maybe slightly more. And because of this, uh, ticks that require these many hosts um, can take much longer to complete their full life cycle. It can take sometimes up to three years. So um, this is a very important determinant in their survival because many of them die because they just cannot find a host for their next feeding. They feed for short times and they drop off, right? So, so that's a difference between soft and hard tick feeding strategies. And how do ticks find their hosts? So they cannot... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, fly or jump, okay? So they don't have wings. Uh, so the only thing they do, they can do is walk, uh, crawl, and they can do that pretty fast. But they find their hosts, they're very, very, sen because they're very sensitive to their environment. They are known to recognize light changes, temperature, chemicals, like, you know, from odor. Uh, they can sense carbon dioxide and heat, which are the two major uh, cues for them to find their host and their sensory organs are on their front legs and that's so those are their noses so to say so they cannot fly or jump and they wait this is very interesting wait in a position that's known as questing so they wait for their host and here's a questing tick that's a great picture of a questing tick you see how they um you know, they grab onto their, their plant substrate or, or wherever they're at, we're using their other pairs of legs and the front pair is stretched out. And at the end of the tips of the front pair, they have a little latch, a claw-like structure, and they use that. So when a host brushes past, like it might be us, it might be an animal, um, it quickly latches on. And sometimes uh, some ticks, they'll, they'll wander around and find a good spot on the host, like where the skin is thin or tender, but others latch on immediately and start feeding. Okay, so that's how they do. And, and I have a video, interesting video later, which I can, I'll show you, uh, depending on the time, but I will certainly give you a link. I really want you to see it, okay, on, on this, on tick feeding. And uh, ticks have very efficient mouth parts to feed on their hosts. Of course, they're blood feeders, right? They need to ensure that they get the required supply of blood without being stopped. So many of uh, blood feeding arthropods have this uh, remarkable adaptability. So first they have extremely sensitive apparatus to locate their host. And then they have specialized piercing and sucking mouth parts 
saliva components to prevent blood coagulation, blood clots, then they cannot feed, right? So they have very, uh, they have saliva components that prevent blood coagulation and, um, and the host immune response. So the, the host reacts then and produce a re uh, immune reaction that'll, that is not helpful for the tick. So they have that as well to combat that. And above all, <clears throat> ticks have the capacity to accommodate huge and very dramatic increase in their gut volume. So think of an engorged tick and we'll see more pictures too. So they have that capacity, that remarkable capacity, which I don't think any other arthropod does actually. The number of times the size increases after a full blood meal. So here are some close-ups about uh, off the mouth parts. Wow, right, look at those teeth on that. Uh, on that thing <laughs> there. So um, they've remarkably adapted, like I said, those um, you know, inward curving teeth on the stylostome, which is inserted into the post. So that does not pull out easily. Uh, and uh, saliva, their saliva is also very unique. It's, uh, it's like concrete, which is before it is set. Think of concrete before it sets. It forms a tube, actually a feeding tube. And plus it contains all of those anesthetics and anticoagulants, immunosuppressants and vasodilators. So it dilates the blood vessel so that there's free flow of blood. It's remarkably adapted for that. And it's all, it also helps in water regulation so that you know, they can concentrate all of those nutrients in the blood that the ticks need to survive. And here, this is why ticks have public health importance, right? In the process of blood feeding, they transmit the widest variety of pathogens, even more than insects, which are remarkable vectors, very significant vectors as we know. So, but ticks transmit a wider variety of pathogens than insects. And these include all kinds, you know, uh, that you can think of bacteria, viruses, protozoans, so many more. And in the US, there are about tick, uh, 12 tick species, uh, which are of public health or veterinary importance. And uh, there's a list, a long list of uh, diseases that they transmit. So the next question is how do ticks get infected? Well, there can be horizontal transmission. So the pathogen is acquired from a host and it develops or multiplies in, within the tick and then it's transmitted to the next host horizontally. It can also be vertical where, a, where an, um, a young one, the larvae, uh, gets, the, gets the, the pathogen from its mother when the female lays infected eggs. So this they can be horizontal and vertical transmission. And how about when, how, how do they transfer it to? Uh, so yeah, it's, it's the same. Uh, pathogen transfer can be transovarial. Uh, it can be from one, uh, one tick to its offspring through the egg. And this is what happens in the case of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is a very important tick-borne disease. And I will talk a little bit about it certainly. And it can also be transstadial, which means uh, it can transfer from one life stage to the next. And this is what happens with Lyme disease, which is another important tick-borne disease. And uh, once, sorry, yeah, once, uh, once infest, infected, that's how the transfer takes place. Now, tick-borne illnesses are largely seasonal. And I'm sure many of us have noticed that, right? They tend to peak in the hot summer months because that's when ticks are most active, right? However, if conditions are favorable, like in Arizona, ticks are active almost year round. So it's always tick season here, in some places at least. So that's the peak and summer, as you can see, doesn't really uh, end at any time. And uh, it's also good to be alert about tick-borne illnesses. And here are some conditions that could indicate a tick-borne illness. It's very important to recognize that. So if you have uh, a fever and related symptoms, that's what febrile illness means, fever and related symptoms like you know, tiredness, or dullness, and, you know, body aches, things like that you get when you get a fever or some kind of a uh, illness like that. 
without apparent cause. That is when you suspect a tick borne illness. And if it's, it occurs during that high tick activity period, which is from May to September, hot summer, um, it could be. And if a person ha, you know, travels, has a history of tick bite, you know, you know that some, someone has, has been bitten by a tick or has been exposed to ticks, that's a good reason to suspect. Uh, or if people have been in an area which has a history of ticks, uh, or a travel history of travel to endemic areas, areas where there are some diseases are endemic. Uh, if blood work is done and that indicates a low platelet count or elevated liver enzymes, that could be an indication. The rash, however, which is uh, very easy to identify, very, very dramatic sometimes, the rash is, however, not always a feature of tick-borne illnesses. So, uh, and it does not indicate uh, tick-borne illness all the time as well. So that's good to know, right? Now, let's look at a few important species in the US. And uh, here we go. Okay. So uh, these maps are all from the CDC website and um, certainly go and go there and check them out. So the first one I want to talk about is the brown dog. It's the most widely distributed in the US and the world. So the US, you can see practically the entire country. It's distributed all over. And uh, uh, dogs are its primary host and preferred host, but they will certainly bite humans and other animals. It is notorious for the transmission of uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the Southwest. And uh, See the distribution, it's everywhere. And um, the scientific name, by the way, is Ripicephalus sanguineus. Now, you don't, you don't have that on your quiz, don't worry. <laughs> I just mentioned it because the, the stick is so important. And as, you will, as we move down the list of species, you'll see the others are not as widely distributed, of course. The distribution kinds of, kind of gets more and more restricted. So here's the next one. This gorgeous stick is the American dog tick. Slightly less distributed than the brown dog tick. And uh, it's mostly towards the east um, and also a small area on the Pacific coast. And uh, the next one is the black-legged tick. Again, mostly found in the east and has an important role in the transmission of Lyme disease and, and many other diseases as well. So black-legged ticks, Lyme, right? And here's another one, the Gulf Coast tick has a smaller distribution along the Atlantic coast. Excuse me. Uh, and, you know, each one has a set of diseases that they transmit. They have their hosts, um, all of that. Uh, here's the spectacular Lone Star tick with its distinguishing white spot. It's distributed in the Southeast and the, and the East. And uh, very, very distinctive uh, with that Lone Star. <laughs> and the Rocky Mountain wood tick. It's another important species distributed most more towards the Northwest. And again, like, uh, like the others, it has its own uh, range of diseases that they transmit. And uh, another black-legged tick, the Western black-legged tick, again, important in Lyme disease transmission. Uh, and you can see its distribution there. And we have a new arrival, the Asian longhorn tick, as if we didn't have enough, right? Uh, which arrived in 2017 in New Jersey. And it's a potential vector of many debilitating livestock and uh, pet diseases. And you see it arrived in New Jersey in 2017, but look by 2021, it's spread to so many other states, right? So they do move around a lot. So, um, that's a very quick overview of species. And because I, I, I don't want to go into individual details of each species and about that, because I don't know how useful it is to look at pictures and you know, talk about it. Instead, uh, and they all look similar, but they are very different. They have so many distinguishing characters, but I would uh, rather focus on, on management. I would like to, that because there are some, a lot of similarities in, in tick behavior. And I think that is, that would be more useful. So um, that's what I'm choosing to do, but 
we can certainly have uh, a discussion and or if you have questions i can try to answer those right now i said i want to mention one this one tick a little, in a little more detail just because it's so widely distributed and feeds on all stages of dogs and um, the larvae and the nymphs are occasionally feed on humans when especially when populations are high and hosts are not enough uh, so uh, it's very important to be aware of this uh, tick and um, brown dog ticks are an important vector of RMSF or Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And they transmit it both um, transovarially and transstadially. They do both. So um, it's a very, very important tick. And um, here are close up uh, dorsal and ventral views. Dorsal is from above and ventral is from, from down below. And it's a hard tick. So you can see that that's cutellum. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving here on the screen. It's, you know, that's cute, the hard plate on its back. That's that's why, it, that's a character of hard ticks. And you can see its mouth parts, right? You can see them from above. So that's the brown dog tick. And um, these ticks are, are, are really special in so many ways. So there's several generations that can occur, that can be born each year. And uh, it has four uh, stages, like we all discussed, the egg, larva, you can see the pictures here, the six-legged larva and the eight-legged nymph and the adults. And each active stage seeks a new host and then drops off to develop, to grow in a protected area of the environment. And their environment is mostly peridomestic, you know, in and around homes. And uh, so they seek cracks in flooring or, you know, kennel walls where dogs lie uh, or in patios, sometimes in gardens, all of that. And uh, the brown dog tick is unusual among ticks because it can develop completely, can complete its entire life cycle indoors. It doesn't have to go out. Why? Because dogs, it, it, if there are dogs and certainly it can complete its entire life cycle indoors. Whereas other ticks which have one two you know multiple hosts they have to go outside at some point but not the brown dog tick so that's important to know uh, that's why its management is so so important and uh, here are um, more pictures of uh, an engorge tick in the process of engorgement uh, you see it's it's not there yet but how firmly it's attached uh, you know, on the skin of the dog you part the the fur you can see and here it is really engorged. It can hardly, <laughs> hardly lie flat. It's like blown up like a balloon. And its little legs are, are sticking out of its body. So um, it's kind of gross, but uh, it's how remarkable it is that they can feed that way, right? And little, it's good for, you know, several days, weeks, sometimes some ticks can stay without fast for even a year. They, they shut down, of course. They shut down their metabolic processes, but they can do that. It's pretty amazing. And um, they have incredible reproductive capacity. So after a full meal, a female can lay up to 4,000 eggs. So as she's pumping them out, and uh, uh, here you can see the, a few engorged ticks next to a penny. So you know, just to get a combine. If anyone has not seen an engorged tick, Here's your chance, <laughs> right? And uh, yeah, that's about brown dog ticks. And I did want to mention about RMSF just because it is so important. So the name comes from the spotted rash on the skin. You see that? But the rash is not always present. Remember I mentioned that. So please keep in mind that uh, the rash is not always present. You don't always look for the rash. So there's so many other symptoms. So the RMSF is transmitted through the bite of an infected tick. That's how it's transmitted. And it affects children and the elderly the most, which is unfortunate. And um, the causal pathogen is a bacterium, Rickettsia rickettsii, which affects the endothelial cells. And endothelium is the lining, is a membrane that lines the inside of the heart and blood vessels. Pretty serious, right? And uh, symptoms include, uh, uh, you know, regular fever, headache, can be as simple as that or the rash, but it's rapidly progressive if it's not, if there's no intervention. So rapidly progressive disease can affect respiratory, gastrointestinal, and the nervous system, and result in multiple organ failure in severe, severe cases, and even death, unfortunately. 
and here is uh, sorry for the disturbing picture but you know um, i wanted you to see it um, it's so there's other typical symptoms as well which include nausea vomiting all of that uh, can develop into cough pneumonia stomach pain confusion there's so many symptoms and necrosis this one of the most you know the ultimate uh, symptoms the extremities die basically there's no blood circulation and they die and however rmsf can be effectively very effectively treated with antibiotics that's a good thing if it's detected in time and treated patients make a full recovery so be aware, let's be aware of it right and and help to prevent transmission so back to ticks and dogs from rmsf so risk factors for for rmsf are roaming dogs certainly roaming dogs with stray dogs uh, it's not specifically restricted to any particular household it's a big risk factor dogs that are not fixed spayed or neutered cluttered or poorly managed yards big risk factor and and it's important to remember that dogs can get rocky mountain spot fever as well however they cannot transmit it to their humans okay so uh, yeah that was a quick overview about ticks and their and rmsf now i want to move on to management excuse me yeah management i think about um, about half a point there and um, i want to mention prevention so the first step i always talk about uh whenever we talk about pest management prevention is a if you don't have it you don't have to manage it in the first if you don't have it in the first place you don't have to manage it right so some of the most essential steps in tick ipm um check for ticks remove them immediately if found sanitation sanitation is important in any ipm program reduce the art clutter you know, remove habitats that that ticks love tick control on pets apply tick collars or topical pesticide on on pets dogs especially tick control in the habitat in the environment so all of these are essential for tick ip and so you know from the basics after outdoor activity and and this is i'm sure this is a refresher for many of you you already know this but i have to mention it after outdoor activity especially if you are in a tick prone area you know there's a history of ticks in that area or if you don't i mean how would you know right if it's a new area make sure you do these things after you come back home tumble your clothes in a dryer on high heat for an hour bathe or shower definitely after coming indoors that sometimes helps you to notice ticks and remove them examine gear and and pets uh and you know be aware of uh, antibiotics if you're bitten you know reach out to your doctor or medical care provider and and be aware of that now you're aware right rmsf is a real thing and uh, learn the learn to recognize the signs of tick borne illnesses and and we will talk a little bit about that as well um and you know make it a routine tick check and removal make it a routine and and if you can record the dates uh, that you've uh, had those encounters Uh, and you know any information that you can find that's always helpful so tick checks tick checks are really essential after every outdoor activity and every day even if you don't go out during tick season check for ticks and here are some of the important spots where you should check all of these are areas where skin folds closely or our clothing and skin have close contact like that hold warmth and moisture ticks love those areas so all of these areas like you know that i mentioned here back of neck elbows etc waist belt line nobody thinks of that belt line is where clothes and uh, skin have close contact like and and women bra the bra line that's also a very important place where ticks can latch on they love those places okay and um, tick removal tick removal is a very important step it has to be done right using a pair of fine tipped tweezers or a, a tick remover um and you grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible and gently pull it straight upwards 
not to the side, not to the back, but straight upwards. That's very essential to make sure that all of the tick is removed. No, not that its mouth parts remain in the skin. Don't want that, <laughs> right? So make sure that all of the tick is removed and then wash the area with soap and water. That's sufficient. Or if you have a disinfectants like alcohol, rubbing alcohol, then yeah. And also it's important to note, if you have a tick bite and if you get symptoms like two to 14 days after that, you know, one to two weeks, go to see a doctor. Just make sure if you can, you know, hold on to the tick, that's awesome. You can, uh, you can, that'll be very helpful for the doctor also. Okay. And proper tick removal. Do not use, a lot of people do this. Do not use petroleum jelly you know, to smother the tick, so thinking that it will release its hold. Doesn't do that. A hot match, same purpose, right? You light a hot match and, and, and bring it near the tick, thinking that it will release. It will not. Nail polish or other products to remove a tick. Do not do that. Never pinch or squeeze an attached tick. Why? Because it may that will make it regurgitate what it's sucked up. May, and mix with pathogens, it will regurgitate it, it back into the cyst, our bloodstream. Don't want that, right? And proper, properly dispose of ticks. That is also very, very important. So here's a picture of the um, tick uh, remover. I don't know. I haven't used it, but I have, I've seen it. Uh, so that's a very effective tool for removing ticks. You see it's very, bring it close to the ticks uh, where it's attached and then you lift. There you go. You have the, <laughs> the tick there, right? But a tweezer, a pair of uh, fine tip tweezers will easily do the job. And um, how to dispose of a live tick. That's also important. You don't just throw it back into the environment, right? So you put it in, a, in alcohol, if you have in a little vial of alcohol uh, or in a sealed bag or container, make sure that it cannot get out. Or you can wrap it tightly in tape. If you don't have alcohol or a seal, sealable bag or container, you can wrap it tightly in tape and then flush it down the toilet. All of these options are, are possible. But never, never crush a tick with your fingers because if you have a, a wound or you know broken skin on your fingers and the tick has blood in it, right? You know what happens. So um, at this point, I wanted to try, oh, sorry. I, Hmm, the video doesn't work there, but uh, okay, no worries. I'll share the video later. It was just a video on how to remove the tick, the correct method for removing the tick. But uh, we can talk about, I, I can share that video later. It's available on YouTube. Hmm? All right. So next is to recognize tick bites and um, bite allergies and reactions. So tick bites have a wide range of reactions. It's not just that little red welt that you get on your skin. So it can be minor, minor inflammations, but the reactions can be severe sometimes. They can be, of course, they can be rash. They can be a fever, nausea. And this is not just in the case of RMSF, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It can be other, you know, without that as well. So they, it can, there can be fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, shock, even death can happen. It's very unfortunate. So some sometimes severe allergic reactions are accompanied with edema, which is fluid accumulation. There can be tissue necrosis, which, which mean death of tissues due to lack of uh, blood flow. And um, lesions can take a very long time to heal. Sometimes there can be anaphylactic shock as well. So you need to administer an um, anti-allergic shot sometimes. And tick paralysis is a condition caused by a toxin in derma center ticks. Now, American dog ticks belong to this genus. Brown dog ticks do not. So tick paralysis is a very serious, serious condition. And it, it can be reversed immediately upon removal of the tick. That's the, it's because of the toxin that's been injected when the tick feeds. However, and it can result in death if the tick is not removed, especially in, in younger individuals. So certainly something to be aware of. So we should prevent tick bites, right? As much as possible. So, and to do this, we always use caution in areas where there's known tick activity. 
or a tick prone areas example in where there's high unmanaged vegetation or clutter and when you're in those areas wear long sleeved clothes wear long sleeved shirt long pants tuck pant legs into the socks and if all of the clothing is light colored that's great because it ha- always helps to see ticks better and ticks and other insects that are blood feeding thankfully they are most of them are dark colored so that helps right um use personal repellents epa approved personal there's so many choices uh, deet is a great option of course uh, and always uh, follow label instructions you know the label is the law so always follow label instructions and some products uh, do not repel ticks they are only for mosquitoes so the, reading the label on the or the sign signs on the container is very important some repel both and and for different amounts of time all of that information is on the container the label of the uh, repellent so it's very important to pay attention to that uh permethrin um is an option only to treat clothing uh not on directly on the skin so these these are things to keep in mind when using personal repellents tick prevention around the home uh this is what i was uh, talking about when i you know mentioned community environments in the beginning certainly on lawns so removing leaf litter remove sanitation cleaning up removing leaf litter and you know, keeping vegetation trimmed that is a, a huge help because it reduces tick habitat um stacking firewood neatly in a dry area and away from the home not stacked up against the wall that is uh, very essential uh, discouraging uh, wild animals or uh, stray animals from entering your yard by fencing it that is because ticks do drop off from from animals that they are feeding on right um and you know declutter decluttering the yard is also very very super important so the old furniture mattresses and uh, you know, toys tarps anything that can give ticks a place to hide that that has to be removed i know it's easier said than done but it is essential essential for um, managing ticks around the home um preventing ticks on pets pets are family members right and uh, it's essential to check them as much as you check yourself it's very essential to do tick checks on pets daily especially after they spend time outdoors if you find a tick on your dog immediately remove it and we uh, discussed how to you know dispose of a, of a tick after you find it you can you know store it in a sealable container you know uh, put it in the freezer you can store it in the freezer so it'll remain fresh and you can ask your vet to conduct a tick check um, and and also analyze the tick if possible reduce tick habitat in your yard and uh, you know get be aware get information get educated about tick borne diseases in your area and protect your pets now the next slide is going to be a little bit disturbing but i wanted to share it to show how severe uh, severely how badly pets get infested so this little puppy is really in distress right see how they are all concentrated on that tender inner ear right so okay <laughs> tick collars can certainly protect dogs from ticks and uh, there are other uh, uh, spot treatments as well tick powders and um, collar all the dogs in your yard if you have uh, multiple dogs collar them all and follow directions on the package and there are certain tips also to be followed while using collars i'll cover that um in a little bit next is management of habitat so i wanted to spend a little time on this how are we doing on time i have about 15 minutes more i think right okay so surveillance i wanted to mention this because it is um, especially in areas with a history and highly prone areas it provides valuable information and here are some surveillance methods for uh, for ticks um dry ice traps are very uh, effective uh carbon dioxide is too um, heavier than air so if you have a container with dry ice 
placed on a, a sheet, a white sheet, a fabric, um, ticks are attracted to it. They cl crawl onto the white sheet and they can be uh, collected. And uh, tick drag is a, it's a piece of fabric, heavy fabric that's pulled through vegetation or a tick flag is a similar, it's wiped across vegetation. So all of these are techniques you can do to surveil for ticks and be aware of uh, what species are around, how many, things like that. Home assessments are also valuable. And um, when, you, when you conduct home assessments, I have conducted home assessments. So we examine for suitable micro habitats in the peri-domestic environment, which means the environment immediately adjoining a home or residential area, right? So we look for uh, all of these. Are animals present? Is pet housing present? And you know, are there access points to the crawl space? How is the vegetation? Is it growing wild? And other debris, you know, is the yard cluttered? Things like that. And um, engorged ticks crawl into cracks and crevices that are dark and tight to develop and molt into the next. We, we saw that. When, remember, we talked about the brown dog tick life cycle. And uh, there are so many places around the home which provide the, uh, the, the perfect microclimate needed for survival. So when you do a home assessment, we look at all of these factors and uh, more, uh, more points to be examined, uh, in, both on the exterior and the interior. And uh, vegetation around, around a home increases moisture levels. That's why um, it's so important to get rid of that. Plus if it's if the homes are on uh, uh, po um, poles like that, supports, they create shady places where uh, dogs and other animals can hang out, right? They like to lie there. Uh, voids in concrete on this, this particular uh, concrete uh, support is under that house actually. And um, all of these uh, voids are perfect places for ticks to hide. And sometimes um, areas under houses are used for storage. Again, perfect places uh, for, uh, for dogs and ticks. And uh, over 150 ticks were removed from this single mattress. So great, uh, great uh, micro habitats there. And so the management of habitat essentially helps one, to decrease harborage of tick hosts, example dogs, decrease harborage of molting ticks, and to reduce moisture. So that's what management of habitat does. And uh, free living ticks are also present in the environment. They're not, not always on or associated with the host. And these are a constant source of infestation, which means that we can never take action once and then forget about it, right? It's a constant process. And um, targeted control is the ideal option. That is focus control measures where they are needed, not environment wide. So this saves product it saves, and efforts. It minimizes unnecessary exposure to people, pets and property. Now a quick look on a bunch of tools that we have for tick management in a tick IPM plan. The ticks have many natural enemies. But unfortunately, very few have been actually evaluated and successfully used as biocontrol agents. So there are certainly fungi, bacteria, nematodes, etc. And there are larger predators also that we never think of, birds and parasitic wasps. Uh, mechanical methods are somewhat effective, maybe not by themselves, but in combination with a, a, a chemical. But uh, especially if the infestation is severe, they may not be effective by themselves. Chemical methods are the most effective and we have so many options available. And always a note of caution when using chemicals, education is of utmost importance and I cannot stress the importance of PPE enough. Even though I'm, I'm in Arizona where uh, the, the, the weather is not at all conducive for the use of PPE, we still <laughs> uh, stress the importance and proper signage and notification and disposal of chemicals, chemicals and containers, all, all very important. And I have to mention this. Um, uh, there are uh, many uh, protocols, established protocols for treatment of buildings, indoors and outdoors. Uh, just listed out some of the options here, sprays, dust powders, and where, where to treat. Uh, 
for outdoors, there are a number of uh, products available. And many of you, like I said, it's a refresher. You know this already. A lot of very effective products are available. And here's just a, a scheme for uh, a treating, if you're treating around the house. So if your house on on piers or those supports, um, you treat under the house and six to ten feet beyond the edge of the house, and also treat associated houses where pets or animals reside. That's important. And because of the tick's ability to detect and avoid pesticides, they're remarkable creatures. So the pesticide application should always begin on the exterior of the home and then move away, away into the property. That's how it should be done. And um, if it's uh, a house on slab, not on, not on supports, also remember to treat a band of six to 10 feet beyond the edge of the house. <clears throat> Granular formulations are easy for homeowners to apply and a lot of uh, products are available. Uh, products with uh, pyrethroids are as active ingredients work really well. And uh, always follow uh, the instructions on the package. Like some have to be watered in uh, to be effective. And sometimes reapplications are required. And here's a very important point, especially in peak tick season, treating your yard once a year is not enough. So yards need regular treatments in the summer months. So this is a very important uh, point to remember. And killing ticks in your yard means fewer ticks to bite dogs and to bite humans, right? And uh, a few uh, final points, I think I'm coming to the end of my time here. About dogs and RMSF, I had to mention this because uh, dogs can be infected with RMSF. I mentioned this already. And you cannot get RMSF from your dog. That's also important to remember. So uh, dog population control is very important, in, in, especially in certain areas where um, animal control is not that effective. Uh, it's, uh, it's like one of the first steps in, in tick management. Because animal control and tick management, they go hand in hand. And uh, it's a community-wide effort that is needed. And uh, the benefits are long-term if there is uh, animal control. And here's a great graphic on um, you know, how prolific <laughs> dogs can be. So if there's one pair uh, of dogs in six years, you can get 67,000. That is a good number, <laughs> right? <laughs> so spaying or neutering dogs is better for the dogs too. They live, be live better lives. It prevents them from getting sick and uh, reduces risks of roaming, getting ticks, all of that. So I love that graphic. That's why I wanted to share that. And actually management of um, ticks on dogs is the more difficult portion of the effort. And um, household dogs are certainly easier to treat than free roaming dogs. And, and many approaches require direct contact with the animal. So uh, that's why it's, it's so different. And puppies, I think we saw that, remember the puppy with the ear full of ticks. It's so susceptible and vulnerable. And, um, but luckily we have so many topically applied uh, products that are available. I'm just listing active ingredients here. Collars, same with um, active ingredients, so many effective collars. And uh, it's good to remember, however, collar effectiveness can be reduced in high heat or if the dog swims, jumps into a pool. It's good to remember that. And so it, collars may have to be replaced at some point, depending on what is pro instructions provided on the label. Some products are highly toxic. So always use PPE when handling collars and especially when children interact with dogs wearing collars, pets wearing collars. A uh, little bit, uh, yeah, a little more information about collars. Never use collars on humans, <laughs> okay? Uh, and pay attention to the active ingredients in flea and tick collars. So fleas are insects, ticks are not, right? So uh, not all collars work for ticks and uh, as effectively. The other point, very important point, dogs and cats are not the same. And some dog products are highly toxic to cats. So always um, do not uh, pay attention to the label, and the instructions, and um, do not use appropriate, inappropriate products on cats. 
uh, replace collars on schedule, they expire. And uh, sometimes their effectiveness is reduced because of the heat in the you know, sunlight and um, water, humidity. And uh, also many of the um, claims about effectiveness are based on lab studies not on actual field studies. So, you know, follow the instructions uh, and protect yourself and not just dogs. So effective tick, tick control targets all life stages of ticks. Targets the free living stages, it targets the eggs and the parasitic stages on the host also. So that's important. And that, that kind of uh, wraps up, yeah, wraps up about management. The next question is who does it? Who does tick management? All of these people have a role in it. So it's commercial applicators, definitely. Housing authorities in case of public housing, municipal authorities, if there's a public park or um, a recreational area, they can do it. Public health authorities in the case of a tick outbreak of a tick bone disease, residents of homes can, uh, can do it by using pesticides and other methods appropriately, right? So who does it? That's the question. And uh, as we you know, move on in, with 2022, there are certain tick trends in tick-borne diseases that we're noticing. We have an increasingly mobile society. People travel a lot uh, after COVID especially, right? People are just moving around. Uh, so people and pets and increasingly green society, which means people are not using as much pesticides. People are more aware of that. So <clears throat> that is a change and increasingly sophisticated diagnostics. So there's so many advanced techniques available to detect uh, tick-borne diseases and you know, identify ticks, all of that is there. And dec decrease in medical awareness or suspicion. For many, we don't know what exactly is going on, what the disease is. Sometimes it cannot, may not be a disease like we just discussed. It could just be a symptom, allergic reaction to a tick bite. And um, the biggest, um, biggest alarming factor as for me as, as a professional is this decreasing expertise in vector biology and control. That is scary. <laughs> and, and in many other parts of entom entomology and acarology, I know this personally that we're losing so many people who are ex who have expertise in this. So it's, you know, if anyone is interested in attending graduate school and, and getting a degree in uh, vector biology, go for it, we need you. <laughs> and so <clears throat> um, here, are, uh, here is a link to the CDC website, lots of excellent resources. So uh, I wanted to share that. And uh, let me see here. Do I have time for a short video? Uh, maybe not all of it, but at least I want to mention this because um, it's again, this is available on YouTube and um, I think this will work. Let me see. Hmm, doesn't, does not want to cooperate. Okay, it's a, um, a video available on a YouTube channel called Deep Look. Um, the hills oh. are alive. With silent, waiting ticks. She has to find a host. She can sense animals like us by the carbon dioxide we give off. She reaches out with her front legs. Scientists call this questing. It will use that claw to latch onto something, like your sleeve. Now you see her. Now you don't. Once aboard, she searches out a nice spot to bite into for blood. She lives three years, but in that time, she only eats three meals. A tick needs enough blood to grow from larva to nymph. 
nymph to adult. And then for females to lay their eggs. Gross. Let's check out a nymph, a young tick. It's tiny, smaller than a freckle. To grow into an adult, it needs one blood meal, a big one. The front of its body is all mouth. It digs into us using two sets of hooks. The hooks wriggle into the skin. They pull our flesh out of the way and push in this mouth part, the hypostome. Those hooks anchor the tick to us for the long haul, like mini harpoons. While the speedy mosquito digs in, sucks our blood, and splits, all within seconds, a tick nymph stays on for days. Three days, if we don't find it before then. Compounds in their saliva help blood pool under the surface of our skin. The nymph sips it through its mouth parts, like drinking from a straw. When a tick is full, and I mean completely full, it falls off wherever it may be. Maybe onto your bed. That's if you don't nab it first. You might have heard that you should twist or burn the tick. Not true. Grab the tick close to your skin and just pull straight out. That's how you win the fight against those tenacious hooks. Whoa, I'm so glad that worked. And that also showed up a little bit about tick removal. So uh, yeah, that was my final slide. And here is my contact information. Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. But thank you again. We really appreciate thank your, you. your thank involvement. You. With please the, reach out if you have questions. Thank you. Will yeah. do. Yeah, you have a great rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, bye. Everybody. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Aaliyah, thank you. Lauren. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye, everybody.